In stage one of glycolysis, glucose is broken up into two equivalent three carbon fragments, glyceraldehyde phosphate. In this video, we're going to look in detail at the steps of stage one of glycolysis. In the first step of glycolysis, glucose is phosphorylated at carbon six. The phosphorylation is affected by a molecule of ATP whose terminal phosphate reacts to form ADP. And just to keep the equation balanced overall, there's a proton that's generated here as well. This is the fate of the hydroxyl hydrogen. It becomes a proton that finds its way out into solution. This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme hexokinase. And you can see an image of the active site of hexokinase here with glucose 6-phosphate in the active site right here. You can see the phosphate group and the six-membered ring characteristic of the cyclic form of glucose. Here I'm using the open chain form to make it a little bit easier to see the fates of the carbons as we move through this pathway. Like all phosphorylation reactions, we can think of this as a nucleophilic substitution at phosphorus. ADP departs as a leaving group or nucleophuge, and the hydroxyl group linked to carbon-6 is used as the nucleophile. So really, the enzyme's goal is to steer the terminal phosphate group of ATP in the vicinity of the 6-hydroxyl group. And one thing we find in hexokinase enzymes across different organisms is the conservation or repeated observation of aspartate and lysine residues in the active site. And there's a pretty straightforward reason for this. The enzyme needs to do two things, essentially. It needs to steer the phosphate group into the right position, and it needs to increase the nucleophilicity or Lewis basicity of the 6-hydroxyl group. The positively charged lysine residue is attracted to the terminal phosphate group of ATP. And of course, there are many, many other interactions, primarily ionic and hydrogen bonding, that facilitate the binding of ATP in the appropriate position inside the enzyme's active site. But this lysine residue, very close to the glucose reactant, really brings that phosphate into the right position. At the same time, the conserved aspartate residue increases the nucleophilicity of the 6-hydroxyl, facilitating nucleophilic attack by that oxygen on the electrophilic terminal phosphorus of ATP. The result is selective phosphorylation of carbon-6, and this product is glucose 6-phosphate, or G6P, as we'll call it. In step 2 of stage 1, or what we might call step 1.2, glucose 6-phosphate, or G6P, is isomerized to fructose 6-phosphate, F6P. And just to get a sense of what this reaction is doing, it helps to look at the oxidation level of the carbons involved, which are carbons 1 and 2 of glucose and fructose. In the starting material, G6P, carbon 1 of glucose is involved in a ketone functional group. But in the product, fructose 6-phosphate, this is now an alcohol, so reduction has occurred there. On the other hand, if we focus on carbon 2, we can see that it begins as linked to a hydroxyl group. It begins part of an alcohol, but becomes part of a ketone in the final product. So there's kind of a redox isomerization going on here, where a reduction happens at carbon 1 and an oxidation occurs at carbon 2. The bigger idea of this step is that we want to break up glucose into two three-carbon fragments. We want to break up a six-carbon molecule into two three-carbon molecules through a retroaldol reaction. And in order to do that, we need to position the carbonyl group at carbon 2 so that the bond that's going to break in the aldol reaction is right at the center of the molecule. This isomerization is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphoglucose isomerase, and it operates through a mechanism that involves deprotonation at carbon 2 followed by reprotonation at carbon 1. One thing to notice about glucose is that carbon 2 is an alpha carbon, and for that reason, it's somewhat acidic. In the right enzymatic environment, deprotonation at that carbon and protonation of the carbonyl oxygen leads to an enol-like intermediate with the hydroxyl group still linked to the alpha carbon. In other words, an enediol, an enol with two hydroxyl groups linked to the alkene carbons. The enediol is nucleophilic at both of the alkene carbons, and the enzyme's active site, an acidic lysine residue is oriented to protonate carbon-1 selectively. This leads to ultimately a reduction at carbon-1, since we're going to end up with an alcohol here. At the same time, a histidine residue in the enzyme's active site facilitates deprotonation of the hydroxyl group linked to carbon-2, which ultimately establishes the carbonyl group that we find in the product. If you want to get a closer look at the active site of the enzyme phosphoglucose isomerase that catalyzes this reaction, check out these links.
Step three of stage one is another phosphorylation reaction. What's coming in the near future is a retroaldol reaction that splits the six carbon glucose into two three carbon fragments. But if this occurred right now, the right hand half of the molecule would be left without charge. This creates a permeability issue. That resulting three carbon compound could easily diffuse through the cell wall and out of the cell. To prevent that, phosphorylation occurs at carbon one. And the product we end up with after the second phosphorylation, which again involves a molecule of ATP, is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, F1,6P. Retroaldol of this compound leads to two charged fragments, which ensures that the cell can keep those metabolites inside it and avoid diffusion through the cell wall. Inside the active site of this enzyme, as we've seen previously, positively charged residues are used to guide and direct the negatively charged phosphate. So here it's arginine residues, which you can see in the image, directing that terminal phosphate in the vicinity of the one hydroxyl. This view, which shows the substrate in the active site, makes it clear that there is likely a glutamate residue that's around to help deprotonate the hydroxyl group of carbon one. Recall that that's required to affect this phosphorylation. The hydrogen that is missing in this product is lost as H plus, and that loss is facilitated by a general base inside the enzyme's active site. The key step of stage one is really 1.4, the retroaldol reaction of fructose bisphosphate. And to understand this reaction, I first wanted to look at fructose bisphosphate and analyze it in the light of the aldol reaction, thinking retrosynthetically, thinking backwards. Because the reaction catalyzed by this aldolase enzyme is a retroaldol reaction. So thinking about the aldol reaction in the reverse direction is the right way to understand this reaction. Recall from our earlier discussions of the aldol reaction that this reaction forms a beta hydroxy carbonyl product. And we can find the beta hydroxy carbonyl motif within fructose bisphosphate. The atoms involved are highlighted here in blue. The aldol reaction in the forward direction involves the addition of an enol or enolate associated with an alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is the actual nucleophilic carbon to the carbonyl carbon of another carbonyl compound. And so in the reverse direction, the bond that breaks is this one. The left half of fructose bisphosphate becomes an aldehyde, specifically glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, with an aldehyde group at carbon 1, a hydroxyl group at carbon 2, and a phosphate group at carbon 3. The second product of the retroaldol reaction is a ketone. It's a ketone with a hydroxymethyl group on one side of the carbonyl group and a phosphomethyl group on the other side. The second product is dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and we'll abbreviate these as DHAP or DHAP for dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and G3P for glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. How the aldolase enzyme actually catalyzes this reaction is highly instructive. There are two ways aldolase enzymes can catalyze either forward or retro aldol reactions. One type of aldolase goes through a mechanism involving imine or iminium ion formation, the formation of a so-called Schiff base. And the second class involves assistance by a Lewis acidic metal ion, something like zinc or some other metal cation. In the example aldolase shown here, which is a fructose bisphosphate aldolase, a lysine residue in the enzyme's active site forms a Schiff base, or an imine or iminium ion really, with the carbonyl group that's found in fructose bisphosphate. And so just to orient you to this, here's this lysine residue, lysine 232 in the active site, and here's the side chain bending around, and here is the lysine nitrogen on the end. That nitrogen forms an iminium ion with the carbonyl group, which is located right here. And here, we're actually looking at the product. We're looking at a derivative of dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Here's the phosphate group in DHAP, and here's the hydroxymethyl group. Really, the key mechanistic point is that the formation of a positively charged iminium ion in the active site facilitates the elimination that needs to happen to do the retroaldol reaction. We can also think about this carbon-nitrogen linkage being part of an enamine, where the CC double bond is here, there's a carbon-nitrogen single bond, and an NH bond that's retained. And this enamine is really the immediate product of beta elimination of the right half off after formation of the iminium ion or imine. This structure on the right actually shows you that iminium ion that forms with the lysine residue. Here it's lysine 
232 inside the enzyme's active site. And again, just to show the electron flow, that lysine residue and the condensation to form an aminium ion is key. The key idea is that this facilitates the elimination of something that's actually a halfway decent leaving group, an enamine, from this intermediate. And so you can see that as we do this beta elimination, where we ultimately end up as the final product is an enamine, the enamine of dihydroxyacetone phosphate with lysine 232, and this electron flow has also formed G3P directly. So by a few more elementary steps involving conversion of the enamine to a ketone, we end up at glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And this is really the key step of stage one because now we've split the 6-carbon glucose or the 6-carbon sugar that was the input to glycolysis into two 3-carbon fragments, G3P and DHEP. One of the amazing things about glycolysis is that both 3-carbon fragments, even though they are generated in step 1.4 with different, different structures, get funneled to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And this is accomplished through an isomerization process catalyzed by the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase, which is sometimes given the abbreviation TIM. We've actually seen the TIM barrel in a previous video as an important protein domain that shows up inside this enzyme. One thing that I'll draw your attention to about this isomerization is that it's conceptually similar to the isomerization of glucose to fructose that occurred in step 1.2. This hydroxyl group on carbon 1 in DHAP becomes a carbonyl group or an aldehyde in G3P. So there's an oxidation that has happened at that hydroxy group in DHAP. At the same time, the carbonyl group found in DHAP, the ketone carbonyl group linked to carbon 2, becomes an alcohol in G3P. So there's a reduction that happens there. Just like in the isomerization of glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, here there's a kind of redox isomerization taking place. And as was the case for the glucose to fructose isomerization, a big part of this and a key idea is that carbon-1 is an alpha carbon, is alpha to the carbonyl group. This means that a general base can deprotonate it and get us to an enediol intermediate like we saw in the glucose to fructose isomerization. This image shows the active site of triose phosphate isomerase and we can see here carbon-2 and carbon-1 and how they're positioned for deprotonation of carbon-1 to establish an enediol intermediate. And let's go ahead and just draw a quick schematic of that intermediate just to remind us of what we mean by this. And I'll try to match the conformation of the ligand as we see it in the active site there. So deprotonation and protonation of the carbonyl oxygen leads to the formation of an enol with two hydroxyl groups, one at carbon-1 and one at carbon-2. And to get to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, what we need to do is First of all, deprotonate the hydroxyl group at carbon-1, deprotonate the carb uh, hydroxyl group here, and this will ca happen through the action of a general base, and at the same time, protonate at carbon-2, and this will happen through the action of some general acidic residue, say an aspartic acid, glutamic acid, protonated lysine, something along those lines. This deprotonation and reprotonation at carbon-2 converts DHAP into G3P. And now we're ready to enter stage two because we have taken overall one equivalent of glucose and converted it to two equivalents of G3P. And the same set of enzymatic machinery operates on both equivalents of G3P. So the convergence has come into focus here. We've made two equivalents of this molecule from one equivalent of glucose and only one set of enzymes is going to be involved in stage two which is really the payoff phase. We're gonna take G3P and convert it into something that wants to give up a phosphate group to ADP in order to form ATP.